Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. Um, wanted to spend a little bit of time today talking about a sport which is uh, very close to my heart, which doesn't necessarily get the same level of coverage as say uh, football or soccer, as it's called in the States, or combat sports or anything of that nature, and that is golf. Now, I'm a big fan of golf. Um, I used to go for several rounds a week. Sometimes I've had a bit of free time I would just take my clubs and go down to the local driving range it was always a laugh um, great for your mental health um, yeah and hitting a few balls either on the range or or doing a couple of rounds a week I used to absolutely love it um, and golf golf is going through a bit of a difficult time at the moment and I've got some some major worries that it could rip the game um, in two now, for anyone who's not particularly uh, up to speed on golf, um, golfers are usually members of different tours. So the biggest and most established tour is the PGA Tour, which is in North America. Um, it's where three of the four majors are held every year. Obviously, Augusta, probably the most famous course out there, um, certainly in America. Um, and most of the, the major names of golf down the years um, have been major stars of the PGA Tour, like Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer, Ben Hogan, Gary Player, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy now. These are the big names. They all go and clamour for the, for the PGA Tour, the big bucks, the big prizes, the big tournaments. Um, but then if you're a European golfer, you've also got the European Tour, um, which I think it used to be called the, uh, uh, the Race to Dubai, which was the, the end of season tournament. And again, the likes of Rory McIlroy or Graham McDowell, or a few years ago, you had uh, Lee Westwood, Colin Montgomery. The Europeans would typically uh, base themselves, say, in Europe, or at least come over and play a little bit of time, and they'd be members of, of the respective tours. I think there's also a, a Middle Eastern tour called the MEA, uh, MENA, the MENA tour. So again, it's all regionalised, and golfers can be parts of different tours, can compete in different tournaments. Um, and then of course they compete for the big prizes like the Open over in, in the UK or, or um, you know, like the Augusta National. Um, and for years that's been the format. The, the history, the prestige has typically been in Europe and then the, the razzmatazz and the big bucks has typically been in America. Um, there's no, no system is perfect in any sport and there has been dissatisfaction um, with um, golf as a spectacle I think some of the prize fund split and, and some other bits and pieces for a few years and 2019-2020 there was some serious talk some serious threats of potential breakaway um, tours sort of coming into existence and the one which has now been established and is now making waves is live golf liv golf now the background to that is um they are funded by an entity called the public investment fund now this is a public body of money um, pretty much solely um, bankrolled and financed by the royal family of saudi arabia so this is an investment fund depending on you know which source you read upwards of 700 billion dollars so almost a three quarters of a trillion dollars is in this pot this kitty um, for investment and it's through this group or its affiliation that Newcastle United the Premier League Football Club got bought um, and it's through these kind of um, proxies for want of a better term that a lot of sporting events either in Saudi or connected to Saudi Arabia are now happening so we had Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz 2, um, which was in Saudi Arabia, where obviously Joshua was able to get a unanimous points victory against Ruiz to claim his uh, boxing belts back. There's a Formula 1 Grand Prix, which is going to be going through the streets of Jeddah soon. Um, obviously, as I say, the purchase of Newcastle United and now the backing of Live Golf. And... Saudi Arabia has got a, a bad reputation. I think that's probably putting it 
as a, a mild understatement there internationally. Um, J Jamal Khashoggi, of course, we know what happened with the journalists a few years ago. Um, there's accusations of human rights atrocities, just general corruption and shadiness and other sort of accusations that are typically thrown at nations like Saudi Arabia. And what the accusations are is they're using this this public money, uh, this this PIF, this public investment fund, as a means to finance sporting events, sporting spectacles, and it's it's called sports washing when they're trying to use sport as a means of uh, covering up, um, you know, the accusations that are being thrown at them. Um, Live golf being an example that they're trying to use this this tour, this glamour, this this high value. Um, establishment as a means of, of veering distraction or sports washing as I say. Um, Live Golf is interesting, it is very much a razzmatazz style sort of Hollywood blockbuster way of, of promoting golf. Whereas golf would typically have uh, four rounds of 18 holes, so an event is typically 72 holes over four days, um, Live Golf is only 54 holes. So it's a third less as a means of trying to speed the, the tournament up. Normally golf halfway through a tournament after the first 36 holes will have what's called the cut. So you know players are trying to shoot as low a score as possible uh, and a cut relative to where the leader is will get rid of you know a segment of the field. So players certainly for the first half of a tournament are battling to make the cut get as close as possible to the leader. In live golf there is no cut. Uh, it's almost like a constant shootout, and at the end of the 54 holes, they, you know, whoever has the lowest score wins. I think the largest prize was won by Dustin, jo uh, Dustin Johnson, if I remember correctly. And apart from having this shootout where, you know, you're there from start to end of, of the tournaments, the prize fund is significantly larger. So you've got that attraction for the golfers that they can play fewer events, which are a third less holes, but earn significantly more money in terms of appearance fees, uh, relative prize funds as they go up through the, their, their standings at the end of the event. And of course, if they're victorious, um, a rather large check. And this is causing major ripples through the sport of golf um, to the point where the European Tour and the PGA Tour have formed an alliance as a means of trying to safeguard on the commercial side and the media side um, trying to offer some form of guard and defense against the threat that is live golf. Uh, they're, they're coming with, you know, buckets full of money and it's massively attractive to golfers who have complained about the schedule and the workload for a while now. And, you know, if you are a sports, a sports person, man or woman, you've got a finite career based on your physical ability to maintain, um, you know, what you would call in, in football, match fitness or in combat sport fighting fit you've got a, a shelf life of say your late teens to engulf maybe your early 40s um, that is your window to maximize the ability and your consistency of your game and so of course if you can earn significantly more money for less potentially less travel and having to play physically less not, uh, uh, tournaments or holds that's extremely attractive it's difficult to turn down um, but there's obviously the history involved in golf. Um, there's a certain prestige, there's a certain tradition, there's a structure, there's an establishment and agreement internationally, as I said at the start, between all these different tours. And now we have rivalries and potential legal actions being taken by and against players who are signing up to participate in Live Golf to the point where their ranking points may um, be um, abolished, where they are now fighting for their right to continue to be able to play in majors. This could have serious ramifications. And it's a fine line because players are looking out for themselves. They don't want to play to the point of causing themselves injury, which could affect their long-term ability to, to play the game and obviously their earning potential. It could also affect their ability in later life in terms of mobility. Um, you could potentially have things like arthritis or RSI, 
based on the amount of time that you spent bent over the ball and the the action and the stress that go through your your hip joints or your wrists. Um, it, it's a difficult one because the players are looking after themselves. They don't want to be continuously participating and putting themselves in a physical or mental position which could affect them later in life. Um, but at the same time, there's also the safeguarding of the actual game, the traditions, the values, um, and the audience, uh, which is now you know generations old. So it is a difficult one. This did happen before in the game of darts, where in the 90s the players were unhappy with the way that my, the revenue from the advertising and the sponsorship and the TV was being distributed to the players. And so there was a split between golf, where you had the BDO, and then you had a rival tournament called the PDC, which has now become the the dominant um, the dominant series to the point where if you are not competing or winning in the PDC, there's almost no value to being in the BDO. Its very existence has now been brought into question in what is a relatively short space of time, and it looks like the same might be happening here in golf. Um, various tours like the PGA or the European Tour either are commencing or are considering commencing legal action against players who are going to go and play on Live Tour. Their tour membership will be ripped up. They may have some form of agreement or a contract in place which they might have uh, legal action against. They might have their ranking points effectively torn up and their ability to participate in future majors is sort of up in the air. Now Live Golf, as I say, is funded primarily by Saudi investment, Saudi money. They do have a CEO, uh, ironically a former PGA player called Greg Norman from Australia. Very, very good player, multiple major winner, um, who has voiced dissatisfaction about the PGA Tour for a number of years. And he is now the flag bearer, the pole bearer for, um, for Live Golf. Very, very divisive. And we've recently seen Rory McIlroy who, because there's been an exodus of player going out to live golf, and obviously an upturn in his own play as well, which is good to see. He recently reclaimed the world number one spot. Looks like he's getting a bit of consistency back in his game. He recently called out Greg Norman again, saying that he needs to exit left, as they say. Um, he's been a big critic, very vocal against live golf. Um, he's taken a point of not chasing the money, He's made the point of staying and fighting and protecting the, the legacy of the game of golf. Um, it's, as I say, it's a difficult one because you can see what happened with darts potentially happening again. And golf is a bigger entity than darts was. A lot of money at stake, a lot of geographical territories because of where they go and play, um, the impact on the majors, the amount of TV money and sponsorship that's involved. It is huge the repercussions here if this really did get nasty um and i'm worried i'm worried that one of the games one of the sports that i am um, passionate about and that i love a lot is facing an uncertain future you know it's not healthy if the major participants the major draw which is the players are at loggerheads where you know you can have half the field taken away playing in a rival uh, series which may not even be on tv it dilutes the competition, it makes all competition weaker. It's not healthy if you've got players at each other's throats. It could have a knock-on effect for something like the Ryder Cup, which is an incredible spectacle. And it's really, really sad and really, really worrying. I don't have an answer. I don't have a solution. Um, but I think, although it goes under the radar a lot, golf, I think this is something that needs to have attention drawn to it because this could set a precedent. Now, in football, or soccer as the Americans call it, we had a, uh, a major issue here in Europe within the last couple of years where the biggest clubs, which are the Manchester United, the Barcelonas, Real Madrid, Liverpools, and so on, wanted to break away from the European body, which is called UEFA, who run the Champions League, which is the premier European club competition and they wanted to form their own competition where they could be more in control of TV revenue, they could be more in control of sponsorship, prize money, promotion, uh, the distribution of the wealth, basically. And it was called the European Super League. And the moment that that came out, the, the, the fan uproar, never seen anything like it. 
which was fantastic. The power of the fans, the protests, um, every fan deserves a pat on the back there. Diff very difficult in golf. It's not quite the same thing. Um, but we're seeing something similar. We're seeing a sort of a super league or a breakaway sort of happening before our very eyes. And it could be really detrimental to the game, the very fabric of the game. And I just think it needs to be spoken about more. I think getting the various sides round the table to see if a compromise can be sought where maybe Live Golf can be some form of additional competition that might take the place of some of the lower ranking events or some way that they can coexist without necessarily affecting one another. Because at the moment you've got some of the biggest players in the game not actively participating on some of the other tours having their membership ripped up and inability to protect ranking points and the very ability to compete for the majors is now in doubt that's not that's not healthy and that's not for the for the good of the game moving forward and for the next generation looking to pick up a club so yeah i just wanted to bring that to to light bring that to the attention of people um, maybe they've got their own views on that. Maybe they want to get involved and air them. But I just think it's really, really worrying times at the moment for the game of golf. Anyway, I hope everyone's well. Um, keep checking the channel. Keep checking the podcast. There's going to be more episodes, more content um, dropping your way very, very soon. Take care.